Today, we are talking about, I guess, the very strict rules that sometimes we follow, and sometimes there are reasons for it, and sometimes we might not even know the reason for it. So um, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss it over right, right over to Ben, because we were just in the middle of a conversation, literally talking about naming conventions for teams and also the databases we use and why we make up some of the stuff we do and why we follow rules that existed before. So Ben, over to you. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting. I I I, uh, I think that um, we follow quite rigorous patterns in code, so that when someone looks at code again, they can. It's obvious the intent of something. It's obvious the structure of something. The 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 cognitive load for someone to decode what's written in the code into meaning something is lower by by accepting these patterns. And I wonder whether that rigor is then applied to other team dynamics like is it necessary that we call our team uh, department underscore uh, function underscore team a uh, or one of three and then two or three and three or three is that necessary i mean it, it it tells me it's part of this department and this function and there's three of them and i can easily navigate that hierarchy but is that something that that needs to persist from code and into team life uh, i i would argue against it uh, i'm not sure quite it would save some people some effort sometimes but i'm not sure the loss of identity uh offsets that i don't know if anyone else has any experience there well then i'm just thinking like i the term technical debt comes to mind like if we have to stick to certain naming conventions for teams what if that team changes or like if there's this rigidity that oh if the team changes then we have to change the name and then and then how many times do you have to change a name in the system and i like what happens if you do have to stick to strict strict standards do you lose an amount of creativity or ability to be agile that's, I think that also relates to, I just wanted to throw a question in here uh, along the same lines. Um, you've got two objectives, right? One is I am able to, without an unnecessary amount of work, figure out what this team does, right? And who's in it or whatever. I can get information on the team. And the other one is I want to try and empower the team to have fun at work, to, to build a culture, to, to have an identity that brings them together, right? Now we've we've worked with teams for a really long time. Which of these two things has an easier workaround? Because if I think about the workaround for, for silly team names, it's I have one confluence page with each silly team name, and then I can write beside it the function of the team and all this kind of stuff. And it yeah. takes me, what, 20 seconds if I forget, right? And given that I'm working with this team, how likely am I really to forget what this team does? If I think about the workaround for, for building identity in a team, building a sense of fun in the workplace so people can feel open for serious play, for creativity, for whatever. I mean, I bet any one of us could talk for 30 minutes at least about the benefits of that and how hard that can be at times. It seems like a pretty open and shut case, right? Uh, yeah, I think when you lay it out kind of uh, economically like that, Eddie, I think people who would struggle to to argue against you, I think absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I think there's another factor as well, which is, um, the constraint of the team, right? If we name a team a certain thing, um, that constrains the team to only do that thing. And, and the opportunity cost of a team doing something else um, can be orders of magnitude larger than, um, than any kind of straight ROI calculation. So I, I, uh, I, I'm firmly behind, uh, you know, letting, uh, letting a team kind of express their identity with a name as opposed to a codified underscore dash dash underscore team b team three c kind of thing i also kind of think whenever anyone wants to like literally over engineer things like a team name or like a process i think sometimes what they're trying to do is take out actually having to have a conversation with someone and asking them a question like hey what does your team do like if you're confused by what like a team like i don't know wonka doodle do and you mentioned in one of our videos um i you're just literally try, trying not to have a conversation it's like i'd rather just read what the team does instead of talking to someone about it and i often see that when anyone in my work wants to over engineer or over label i just ask well, why don't you just go talk to the person sitting next to you or shoot them a slack or an email or pick up the phone a novel so so i think that's absolutely right but i've got a, a i've got a counterpoint for you and, and i'd be interested to see where we land on this so the, the original intent of a user story was really to encode 
what should have happened, which was a conversation. So originally user stories were like three C's, conversation, uh, conditions of satisfaction or acceptance criteria or whatever. And I uh, can't remember the other one, but right. essentially it was to codify a conversation into something that could be put on an index card and then later it was put into Jira. Um, and you could say, well, that just, just happened in a conversation. Like, And if you were close enough to your product owner, you would probably say, right, right, product owner, what do you want me to build next? And they would articulate to you in a conversation. Where, where At what point does it go from being useful to codify, so using a user story, versus having a conversation and then we go too far and we start to codify everything right so now my jira has got 20 boxes i must fill in for it to be valid and the name of my jira should follow this uh, naming convention because it sits in a epic hierarchy blah 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 so on and so forth so so user stories are commonly accepted as something useful but they kind of are the codification of a conversation so how do we balance those two contradictions but I think actually we're talking about the same thing because both of what we said in, includes the same word, conversation. But what I often see where, where in a lot of my work is people miss out on the conversation and they just put stuff into a JIRA and then they assign it to someone without having a conversation and they go, oh, okay, go do the work. And the person tries to do the work and then the person who wrote the ticket is upset when the work isn't done the right way because the conversation never happened. And I think that's what I often see is people rely on the tool or on, on these like emails or, or just assuming people understand the requirements without actually talking through them. And I think they think Jira is just a quick fix for, okay, I could just write it in and it'll get done. And that's not the case if you don't have that conversation. And it's interesting, uh, Jeff Patton, who wrote um, user story mapping, um, one of his famous, favorite things as part of kind of his his uh talks that he does is like what's the most what's the most important part of a user story it's like the author like who whoever wrote it forget the user story pick up the phone speak to them have a conversation like exactly that, that's the most important part i feel very strongly about that i think we over engineer things just so that we can get out of having a conversation or what people like to say useless meetings but really what we're missing is that actual conversation of confirming that these, yes, these are requirements. Does everyone understand? And then it's not just a meeting. It's actually a working session that was productive. And if only more people understood that. <laughs> I think it's important to remember though, that there's a journey that needs to be taken here, right? So Eddie was talking about, oh, it's just 20 seconds in compliments for me to update the thing. If I know what the name is, but like, what if 80% of the scrum masters don't do that? Right. What if what if the culture of the environment is such that, you know, you've got a couple of teams that are agile and they're rolling, but everyone else isn't interested in having that conversation. And and we're not at we're not collectively agile enough to to bring that in. So you have to fall back on those kinds of guardrails where things are documented and things are well laid out. And then it's it's kind of like a like a teasing out, right? Like a playing a game of Jenga of like, okay, how many of these things can we pull out? Like how strong is the backbone of our agile transformation so that when we start pulling out these things that we were falling back on from a structural perspective, the whole thing doesn't fall apart. From a Scrum Master level, um, th there is, of course, a balance that needs to be found. But um, if I name you know, my team the wackadoodles and someone else is searching up and doesn't know what they do and they get you know, kind of I have to go look on, on conference to see what the team function is, then that's kind of challenging them to reconsider, right? It's the same way if I move away from old reporting methods and say, if you want an update of our work, look on our JIRA. Yeah, it I, maybe the structure can't support it or something, but I would be in favor of kind of using these slight irritations that might arise from doing things this way as a kind of incentive to maybe you know, make people question the way they're doing things or, or spark some kind of conversation that would happen off the back of it. Seriously, let us know what you think in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, and let us know if, if any of these uh, problems resonate with you. And please subscribe to our channel because we have a whole lot more videos to come. Thank you.